Carolina drops a game in Atlanta that they should have won against Georgia Tech. And the chief reason is not the end of game scenario that we're all yelling about. You are locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Wednesday, January 31st, 2024. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and I want to welcome you in and thank you for joining us to get your team every day. In particular, I want to welcome in you everydayers, but if you're not an everydayer, A, you should be. <laughs> but second, we'd love to invite you to join the Locked on Tar Heels Discord community where we're hanging out talking Carolina stuff all day long. It was a great therapy session in there last night after the game. It's free to join, and the link is in the show notes. We'd love to have you. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers join today, and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Hey, just a couple things ahead of the show today as we get rolling. Pac will be with me on Friday, Coach Pac Kilby. And so you can look for him there as we kick off and, and preview the Duke game. As I kind of joked about with the Discord, today's episode is a therapy session after a Carolina loss, particularly in ACC play, particularly a game that you don't like, that you shouldn't lose. We got to just like come together and commiserate. And so that's why we're all here. But I'm a glass half full kind of guy. So if I can, mightn't I offer us just a quick glimpse of perspective about where we're at right now versus where we were at last year and even the year before at this point? You know what we're not saying right now? Oh, man, this loss stinks and it really hurts our bubble chances. <laughs> this year, we're saying, Oh man, this stinks and it's going to hurt our number one seed chances. What a difference a year makes. So let's celebrate that. But let me also say that even as the positive guy that I am, I'm frustrated by this loss, man. Carolina should not have lost this basketball game. Just clear and plain and simple. This is a game that North Carolina should have won, but they didn't. And so, you know, it's sports. It happens. And so rather than moan and pout and reactionarily just yell and scream, put Hubert Davis on the hot seat. Let's work at sorting through it together and figure out why this happened so that it cannot happen again. But I've been saying it at some point, Carolina is going to get dinged and they did because it's sports and it happens. So I will praise where we should as we talk today and I'll be critical where I should as we talk today. All right, the score, Georgia Tech 74, North Carolina 73. The Tar Heels are 16 and four overall, nine and one in ACC play. As we record, the Tar Heels are seventh at Ken Palm, 20th in offensive efficiency, and third still in defensive efficiency. ACC standings, still first, but not that two-game cushion you had before things started on Tuesday night. Okay, let's get into this thing, and I want to start at the end and work kind of our way back because I just I want to get this out of the way first because I know it's the thing we are all most passionate about and the thing we want to most talk about. That was a foul. R.J. Davis was fouled. You cannot convince me otherwise. I don't care what camera angle you show me or what you try to say about R.J. initiating contact. The defender did not do the things the defender has to do to maintain Luke will guarding position. RJ Davis should have been at the free throw line with an opportunity to at least take two shots to try to give North Carolina a win. But the dude is the best free throw shooter in Carolina history by percentage. At the worst, he's going to send this game to overtime. But he's going to win it. <sighs> now, we'll talk in a little bit about why Carolina shouldn't have been in that position to start with, because as I alluded to in the cold open, this play, this non-call was not what lost Carolina the game. There are other things to say about that, but I do want to address this first because it's what's got us all hot and bothered right now. Now it, it's all the more difficult to accept this non-call because of what happened in Cameron Indoor Stadium on Saturday when Tyrese Proctor uh, drove and was fouled and it was called. He went to the free throw line down one, his team wins. Now, 
I'm not saying that shouldn't have been a foul. I th- I thought he was fouled. I thought Tyrese Proctor was fouled on that play. And frankly, Clemson shouldn't have been in that position. They had a bunch of turnovers down the stretch. But for North Carolina, RJ was fouled and he needed to do it. And it's here's the other thing for me. RJ is probably your ACC player of the year. He is a clear-cut first-team All-American. Why isn't he at getting the benefit of that doubt? Right? Like it that needs to happen. And here's the other thing for me. That possession before where Carolina took the lead, where by the way, RJ uh had that strip. Um the the ball gets loose. He kind of somehow emerges with it, just took off like a rocket, gets to the rim. He was fouled on that play too. There was too much body not to call that one. So Carolina should have already been up by two, meaning that that final Georgia Tech bucket should have only tied the game. And then, oh man, I just, there was a lot of bad missed things there down the stretch for me. Um, Now, let's go back to that Georgia Tech bucket that put them back in the lead. That was ultimately the game-winning basket. Carolina, you know, there was a timeout. I I didn't like that Carolina switched it and allowed Baycott to be guarding um, the the ball care uh, ball carry the ball handler excuse me, um Nathan George right yeah um it's not how Carolina this year at least has been typically defending ball screen action it's not how they were typically defending it through the game they're using drop coverage but they chose to here and to his credit I thought Mondo made made the shot more difficult right like he had to kind of hit it going away to his but. I, I, I didn't agree with that call now, j- like two inches the other way. And it's like, Hey, great job, Mondo. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, okay, that's fine. Whatever. Um, the other thing is let's applaud Carolina because one of the things we've been talking about a lot is Carolina's ability to close whether up or down. And they did it again. With five minutes to go, or 4.45, let's even put it later, because that's true too. With 4.45 left in this game, the Tar Heels were down eight. 50 seconds later, they were down by one. And then the next play after that was that banked in three from Georgia Tech. And it's like, oh, that's the night it's going to be. You know, like I write, uh, typed down in my notes at that point, like, oh, an, an unfortunate, lucky nail in the coffin. And it stinks because Carolina, despite everything that happened and the fact that everything was pointing to them losing, got back to where they were in a winning position and they were one defensive stop short. They were one non-whistle away from getting all the way back and escaping with a victory. But the difference this time from the other times when they've closed as they've been doing is they didn't slam the door shut hard enough and Georgia Tech pushed it right back open. That's tough. It's also tough because in those final, like the final four minutes of the game, Georgia Tech's only points were that weird banked in three pointer we just talked about. And oh, by the way, that was another missed call because homie traveled before he shot at Sturdivant, right? Is who it was. So there was that. There was the non call on RJ's layup to give Carolina the lead. And then there was obviously the non call at the end of the game. That's three pretty egregious things that could have flipped the tide in Carolina's favor by multiple points. And then the, uh, the, the shot over Mondo to, uh, to give Georgia tech the final lead. Those were the only five points scored in the final four minutes of the game for Georgia tech. Carolina did what they needed to. They just couldn't get over the hump all the way and stay there. Part of the issue in the second half for me was that at times Carolina was not playing like the veteran team that they are. They rushed shots. They settled for shots. I, 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 let's, a lot of them did it, right? <laughs> Don't have to just pile on. It, it was not one guy. Multiple Tar Heels fell prey to that. That's not what this team has been this season. They've trusted their offense. They've done the things they need to do um, to, to get in position to allow the offense to be efficient and not settle for Um, inefficient shots or threes when you've got a driving lane or, you know, any of those things, Carolina just didn't, they didn't attack. 
there were moments when they did, but they did not attack consistently in the same way they've been doing. Now, part of this, listen, credit to Georgia Tech, who switched up some defense, who uh, Coach Stoudemire exploited some things. You know, nice job. But Carolina still has to be able to diagnose that and not settle. And I want to just clear one other thing up really quick, if I can, because uh, I've gotten a lot of pushback from folks um, about the uh, the trap game conversation from yesterday's show. There, there's something from that that everyone that's lashing back out at me is getting wrong. And I'm fine. Look, I've got thick skin. I can take that. But I do want to clear this up because I won't stand for people saying that I said something I didn't say because that's not true. Here's the thing about trap game. I never guaranteed that Carolina would win this game. That's not at all what I said. I never said that. What I did guarantee was that they wouldn't fall into the trap of overlooking Georgia Tech. That's what a trap game is, is when you overlook the opponent. Carolina did not overlook Georgia Tech. In fact, I loved the way they started. I thought it was great, you know, like little um, punch in the mouth from Georgia Tech, and then Carolina responds with a 12-0 kill shot. The they did not overlook the Yellow Jackets. They just didn't have it. And I know some people might start equating those things. Fine, whatever. But there is a big difference between me guaranteeing a win and me guaranteeing that Carolina would not overlook the Yellow Jackets. I just want to set the record straight on that. If you still want to push back, fine, great. I just need to explain that and make sure that I'm not being quoted as saying something that I didn't say. Now, uh, we just talked a lot about the end of the game, but as I said, those end of game moments were not what cost Carolina this game. In fact, it was the events of the first half that were what led to costing Carolina this victory. That's what we're going to talk about in just a second. Right after I tell you that this episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Happy Super Bowl lead up to all of those who celebrate from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. If you're like me, Super Bowl Sunday is all about scoring the best seat on the couch, getting the right food, the right drinks, being with the right people, and getting in on the prop bets, man. It's just so fun. Now, you could just look at the, the odds in total. 49ers are favored by a point and a half, but FanDuel has so many ways for you to end the season with a W. Things like which players will score a touchdown, how many total points will be scored, and so much more. So new customers, join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. All right, we're going in reverse order here today from the second half, the end of the game, because that's what was hot. That was the thing everyone wanted to talk about. But here's the funny thing. Whatever with the end of the game, that's the major talking point. But here's the truth of the matter. The foundation for this loss was laid in the first half. The first half, the first 20 minutes, was what cost Carolina this game. They should never have needed that ending surge. As great as it was to see Carolina respond that way, shouldn't have had to happen. Carolina should have been comfortably ahead and coasted home to a victory. With 5.30 left in the first half, so 14 and a half minutes into this game, Carolina led by 11 points, 36 to 25. At that point, the crowd is out of it. Georgia Tech seems like they're like, yeah, okay, whatever. But guess what? A 12-1 to 1 run later, and this thing was all tied up at halftime, 37 all. That's right. One point for Carolina in that final five and a half minutes and 12 for Georgia Tech. In that span, Carolina was 0 of 6 from the field, 1 of 5 from the free throw line, including the front end of a 1 and 1, by the way, and four turnovers. That means in the final five and a half minutes, if you just followed all that math, 1.4 turnovers for the Tar Heels. Meanwhile, Georgia Tech's dropping 12, and it could have been worse, by the way. There's your problem. Heck, even if you just trade baskets down the stretch of the first half, like, here you go, you score, we'll score. At least you're still up double digits, and then you, then you can start expanding on that in the second half. Although Carolina struggled out of the gate in the first half, that's why Armando Bacot was sitting on the bench for five minutes because Georgia Tech gobbled up approximately 59 and a half offensive rebounds in that stretch. Obviously, I, I'm 
you know, that's hyperbole, but you get the point. I, I said a little bit ago, I really thought the start to this game showed great things for Carolina. I thought it showed that they were ready. They were engaged. They weren't, as I said, overlooking Georgia Tech. They were taking the game seriously. They took the Georgia Tech punch, and they responded with a 12-0 kill shot. But then Carolina just goes through these offensive stretches and goes through these stretches of turnovers where it's like, guys, what, what are we doing here? Um, and, and that's that. That is the problem. The problem with letting Georgia Tech back in this game is that then that crowd that was completely gone when it was an 11-point lead, now they have all half time to think about what could be. We might knock off North Carolina. And the, the team is thinking, oh, man, we're in this thing. Let's just hit shots. That allows the crowd, that allows the coaching staff, that allows the players to grow in their confidence and makes Carolina think about it. Now, all the rest of the season, Carolina, for the most part, except you know the, the other three losses, I just more mean ACC play, has found the way to do it in the second half. And they nearly did. But don't put yourself in a position where you have to figure it out. Because if, if they come out of the locker room down, let's say 15, it's a ball game. You just got to maintain and not get blitzed. And here we go. This is the thing, the most critical issue in this game to me, not free throws, although we'll talk about them in a little bit, is again, the first half turnovers. Last three road games, Carolina has had at least nine first half turnovers, nine at Boston College, 12 at Florida State, and 10 in this game, each of which, by the way, was followed by five or fewer in the second half, two at Boston College, five at Florida State, and just one, one turnover in the second half against Georgia Tech. That's the issue. That is what Carolina has to figure out how to fix. Fewer turnovers equals more possessions, equals more shot attempts, more field goal attempts, equals ultimately more points. Even if you're not shooting a great percentage, holding onto the ball and ending an offensive possession with a shot gives you a much better chance at scoring points. That's just how basketball works. Got to fix it. Got to fix it. And then Carolina is going to be in better shape. If it takes losing a game to learn to do that, which you that's just a myth. You shouldn't have to do that. But hey, if, if that's what it takes and it, it focuses things, great. But something's got to change in the first half. Carolina's got to hold on to the ball and value it more capably so. Well, uh, I'll tell you what. There is some offensive concern with holding on to the ball, scoring these droughts, whatever. But you know who the, I have zero offensive concern for? R.J. Davis. We'll talk about the help that he needs in just a second. Right after I tell you that this episode is brought to you by Jace Medical. I know we come to sports to escape from some of the crazy realities of life. But let's take a minute to talk about preparing for when those crazy realities come. According to the FDA, pharmacies are running out of antibiotics like amoxicillin right in the middle of the worst flu season in over a decade. I can't imagine a more helpless feeling than if someone I deeply cared about got sick while a supply chain issue or shortage kept them from the life-saving medication they need. Thankfully, though, there's Jace Medical, who has this thing called the Jace Case, which is a pack of five different antibiotics to treat a long list of bacterial illnesses, including things like respiratory illnesses, skin infections, and others. And stuff like that can happen to any of us. So visit jacemedical.com and complete your physician encounter. It'll be reviewed by a board-certified physician, and your medication will be dispensed by a licensed pharmacy at a fraction of the cost. It's never been more important to be prepared than today. So go to jacemedical.com and use offer code locked on to get $20 off your order. All right, friends, it is our four corners recap and the shady stat of the game. Let's dive right into it. Number one, RJ Davis needs help. <laughs> he was the only double digit scorer in this game. And oh, by the way, he had 28 points. I just realized I haven't put up. Uh, the box score for us. Let me do that real quick uh, for those of you who are watching. If you're listening, you can go grab it on, um, you know, somewhere else and just look and follow along with us. But I'll, I'll, I'll talk about things as we go. RJ needs help. Here's what I mean. In this game, field goals. RJ Davis, 11 of 24. 
a very respectable 45.8% field goal percentage. The rest of the team, 17 of 53, that's 32.1%. That's not going to cut it, unfortunately. I mean, it almost did, but it's not. It's got to be better than that. Now, there were a couple other guys. It wasn't just RJ, you know. There were a couple other guys that shot well, but in totality, I just want to use that to show what RJ is doing. Meanwhile, three-point shooting, very similar thing. RJ was three of eight in this game, 37.5%. It's not setting the world on fire, but it's good enough. I mean, I'll take that. You know what I'm saying? The rest of the team, five of 20 from three. That's 25%. And then the second the second half was where things were really bad. Carolina shot two of 14 from three in the second half. That's just 14.3%. That also is not going to cut it, unfortunately, for the Tar Heels. And oh, by the way, as you think about that scoring in that offense, Carolina is still yet to score 80 or more points in a true road game this season. And so it's just like, you know, I've had a lot of people saying, Isaac, are we worried about the offense at this point? I'm concerned about these droughts that that seem to be crowded. You know, Carolina's got this spurt ability where they're going to go. I mean, they're getting a kill shot just about every game. That's a 10-0 or more run. But they also go through these droughts, like the end of the first half there, where the, one point in the final five and a half minutes. It's weird. Number two in our four corners recap. One of the, if there was another bright spot outside of RJ, to me it was Jalen Washington, who had a great and helpful and productive 10 minutes in this game. He was perfect from the field. So I know we talked about RJ and what everybody else did, but Jalen Washington was perfect, but only three attempts. So three of three from the field. Eight points. He had also two points at the free throw line where he was two of four. Um, Had five rebounds, four of which were offensive multiple times, even on free throws. Great stuff there. I thought Jalen Washington had good energy. I thought he was disruptive. I thought, you know, he had a beautiful baseline jumper, that vicious dunk. I mean, that was wonderful. I love to see that. I need more of it. I thought, honestly, he could have had more minutes in this game. Why not? You know, try it. Uh, number three in our four corners recap, the Elliot Cadeau fouls. This is something else that I've been asked a lot about since the game. The, the good thing was that in the first half, Elliot didn't have a single foul. That's great. Cause that's where he's often been picking up to and then re- relegated to the bench. And I mean, it's no secret that freshmen in general struggle with learning how to defend without fouling and doing things like this. But, uh, this was a moment where Elliot fell prey to that. All in the second half, five pretty similar fouls. Three of them came within very close proximity to each other in terms of clock. You know, um, I've received, you know, the, the, the questions are things like, were all of those fouls? Should they have not been called? Whatever. I want, here's, regardless of the answer to that, I want to bottom line it this way. I'm a baseball player. And so I often think about things like this. As a hitter, you have to kind of be watching and see what kind of strike zone the umpire has and then adjust to it. As a pitcher, you got to find the same thing. You got to find the strike zone and then adjust your pitching. If he's not giving you the outside corner, you know, maybe nibble a little bit till you can push it further out, but you've got to adjust. The same is so true on a basketball court because different referees are going to adjudicate a game differently than other referees. It's just the nature of humanity. And so Elliot has to realize maybe even after, you know, maybe not after the first, but after the second of those fouls, oh, I see how this is going. I'm going to have to adjust uh, my defensive style, how I have my hands, something so that you're not falling prey to that same kind of call throughout the game. And it bit Carolina, you know, I, I, I thought the heels were much better when he was in the game. The numbers tell that story as well. He had the best plus minus on the team at plus 12. And that was even before Carolina's closing run to almost win the game. So, I mean, it, it, again, it's clear how, um, how positive things are when Elliot's on the floor and it's clear how much he's missing when he's not Carolina needs Elliot Cadeau in basketball games. So, um, and one other quick, just nitpick, if I can, with Elliot, there have been multiple times lately where he's finished with his right hand when he should be finishing with his left. Uh, Twice specific in this game. 
there was, um, and it resulted in an and one. It was great, but he finished, I think it was a reverse that he should have come up under with his left hand and he went with his right. And then there was another one when he should have gone up with his left, went with his right. And if I remember correctly, it was blocked. And so that's just something, you know, maybe it's just, he's not confident enough with it. Maybe he thought uh, he had a better angle and that would help ward it off more than his left hand. But from my observation, it feels like that's just something Elliot will need to work on this off season is his left hand. So there's that. Um, now Elliot's foul trouble and, and whether it's an Elliot or a referee issue is not why Carolina lost this game. It's part of that story, but it's not the thing. Needs to be cleaned up, though. Uh, fourth thing, let's have a positive one, shall we? Yes, please. That would be great. Carolina assisted on 10 of their first 13 made baskets, and in total, 17 out of 28. That is 60.7%. And you know I'm always looking for the Tar Heels to get above 60% on their assist percentage. So good on you, Tar Heels. Way to share the ball well in this game. And you also love it because five different Tar Heels had multiple assists in this game, led by Elliot Cadeau's five assists, against which, by the way, he only had one turnover. So you love to see that. Um, RJ, also, he had four assists, two turnovers. So together, nine assists, three turnovers. That's a three-to-one assist-to-turnover ratio. I will take that. Thank you very much. All right, let's wrap this bad boy with the shady stat of the game. While turnovers where to me the main culprit free throws was 1B in terms of culprit. Uh, it's, it's tough to look at because of how good Carolina has been at the line, how often they've got there, and how they contrasted this Duke team in free throw capability. Uh, I said Duke, sorry. Uh, clearly that's already now on my brain. Uh, contrasted this Georgia Tech team at the free throw line. Well, here's the numbers. Both teams attempted 17 free throws. One team. The Tar Heels made nine. The other team, Georgia Tech, made 15. They take the same number of free throws. One makes six more than the other. A game you'll lose by one. Carolina literally just needed, instead of nine of 17, if they could have just been 11 of 17, which is still not great. But it would have been enough to go home with a W. It's just tough. It's sports, man. It's going to happen sometimes. But it sucks when all these statistical anomalies come together at the same time and Georgia Tech is shooting 15 of 17 instead of their season average of like 67%. It's when George is shooting 8 of 10 from the free throw line instead of his season average of 64. It just happens sometimes. So what do we do now, you guys? We, we recognize everything that happened. We figure out what went wrong. We reset and we prepare for Saturday because it's coming and it's going to be a blast. And it's a big time opportunity to, to get back that two game cushion and a little bit more of some tiebreaker help. So uh, let's do that. We'll get ready for it. Coach Rob will be with me on tomorrow's show. We'll probably unpack some more of what happened here. We'll talk about how you avoid turning one loss into two, things like that. And then Coach Kilby will be with me on Friday. If you haven't already, again, come join our Locked on Tar Heels Discord community. Would love to have you there. It's free and the link is in the show notes. If you haven't also, subscribe to the show on video and audio. Would love it if you would leave a rating and a review. Talk about why you love Locked on Tar Heels. Also, smash the like button if you're watching on YouTube. It's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. I still believe that even after a loss. I hope you do too. We'll talk again tomorrow, but until then, peace.